Hey, man. Hey. What are you doing in New York? What are you doing? I heard there was a 42 questions about to happen. Yes, that's right. We're going to actually meet about? with Fabrice Grinda of FJ Labs and the famed angel investor. We're in an undisclosed location somewhere in the New York metropolitan area. Here we go. Welcome. Hey, Fabrice, how are you? Great to, great to see you. And Likewise. Thanks for having us over to, for 42 Questions. Thank you for coming. You spend most of your time in New York? You spend most of your time traveling? Um, yeah, I spend four or five months a year in New York, and then the rest's on the road. For partly personal reasons, I love uh, adventure travel. So I go, like last year, I went heli skiing in Greenland. I, I, I go ice climbing, I race cars, I go kite surfing in the, yeah. in the Dominican Republic. And my family, I'm French, even though I don't necessarily sound French, and my family is in Nice, and so in, in the south of France, and so I go see yeah. them reasonably regularly. And then I'm an investor in hundreds of startups around the world, and so I also go see them and go yeah. speak at conferences, et cetera. And you also have FJ Labs here in New York as well, which is a, a, an office set up with some staff that does investments. Can you tell us a little bit about FJ Labs? It's a hybrid uh, venture fund yeah. um, and startup studio. Uh, where every year we invest in 50 to 100 startups, yeah. especially marketplace startups, yeah. um, kind of on a global level that's really 70% US, 70% seed, yeah. um, and 70% marketplaces. As an investor, like what, what is the scale of the businesses you're looking to invest in? You say very, very early. At what, what sort of the check sizes you're sort of targeting? So these days, on average, we write 400K checks. Uh, at seed. Seed these days means a two to three million dollar check that's being raised. The company is typically live and has been live for a little while and has post revenue but low revenue. So maybe 100K a month in GMV or 200K a month in GMV. Yeah. They're raising maybe two or three at eight pre or seven pre. Yeah. And of that, we will put 400K. Now, we're, we're rather different because we're not leading, we're not pricing, yeah. we're not joining boards, we don't have minimum equity requirements, yeah. nor do we care if it's a node, a safe, uh, or a price round. Um, the if you don't have a lead and we love you, we'll help you find a lead. Part of the way we work is we actually work with a, and we share deal flow with many other VCs. Um, and our real value add is, is threefold because we think, you know, today we have made 400 investments. Yeah. Uh, we've actually had over 110 exits. Yeah. And on these 110 exits. 110 exits. Realized exits yeah. on 400 investments. And on these 110 exits, we've had a 67% net IRR and yeah. an average 6x multiple, including all the losses and all the zeros, et cetera. Yeah. And, um, when you say net IRR, does that mean you're managing other people's money? So we, we started with mostly, almost only our own money. We do have two other little pools of capital. Yeah. We created a co-investment vehicle where when we put 100K, the co-investment vehicle puts 100K. Yeah. And so now it's not a traditional fund because there's only one capital call up front. Sure. And, and whenever we run, and we don't keep any money for follow-ons and paradas, and whenever we run out of money, we just do the next fund. In the yeah. last two years, We've done five funds, so we're at five fund five. Okay, yeah. Um, but we already have like 40 million under management from these angelist co-investment vehicle. Wow. And yeah. then we have one traditional fund uh, with um, with traditional LPs, one strategic LP, uh, which is Telenor, which is a big Nor Norwegian telco from yeah. uh, uh, from Norway, but they have like 200, they're one of the largest mobile operators in the world, yes. and they operate classified marketplace businesses in Southeast Asia, and they kind of wanted a window in what was going on in the U.S., and so they gave okay. us a big pool of money to manage. Great. Um, so whenever we, we write a check, it's typically three vehicles, but last year, to give you a sense of scale, we deployed 52 million of that, 21 million with Jose and my money. So it's yeah. still like 40% of our own capital, yeah. which in fact is kind of the only way this kind of, this works, because if you're, really good at investing, you're way better off like investing, having a one or two billion dollar fund if you want to make money from fees. Yeah. Uh, if you're investing from a hundred million dollar fund, you, ultimately you're not really going to make that much you money. You need to be investing your own money. It's mu it, makes, it only works because we're mostly investing, we're largely investing our own money. Yeah. You're now starting to invest in other areas. You mentioned, I mean, one of the reasons we're working together on some deals is we're, we're doing some things in the hardware and life sciences area. What do you think is the, the interesting areas going forward? We are thesis driven. At this point in time, there are two main theses we're investing against. Um, yeah. One is bringing all of the best practices of what's happened in the consumer world to the B2B world 
through a marketplace model. And we like marketplaces because it brings liquidity and transparency to previously opaque markets uh, where it was, where you, and, and fragmented markets where you had no liquidity. And so we're looking, and we've invested this year in like marketplaces for scrap metal, marketplaces for petrochemicals, yeah. marketplaces for logistics like, like Flexboard, yeah. marketplaces where restaurants order from farmers. Uh, and all these actually, to the extent they have the right dynamic, meaning if they're fragmented enough, uh, have high average order value, high margin, high recurrency, and they're, they're really great businesses. Yeah. And often everything is still done like by Rolodex and Excel or There's like so much automation email. that can it, benefit the consumers. We're at the very beginning of, of the tech revolution. I mean, if you look, even just e-commerce, it's like 12% of overall commerce uh, in general. But if you look at like in healthcare, there's been, there's been negative productivity. Uh, in education, there's been negative productivity. In public services, there's been negative productivity. Yeah. And, and so all of these various industries actually are at the cusp of, uh, of, of a massive productivity revolution, part of which will be driven by marketplaces. And that now, not everything is marketplaces. We usually prefer to invest not in the technology itself, but in the application of the technology. Yeah. So less in the hardware, but someone using the hardware to do something cool. The other trend or thesis we have right now is we're seeing businesses move from like these horizontal platforms, um, which, were, which are kind of a jack of all trades, but actually require users to do a lot of work. Uh, and where the net promoter score ultimately is not that high. If you look at Craigslist or eBay or Upwork uh, or Thumbtack, the net promoter score of, of these businesses is not great because as a user, you need to do a lot of work. So if I want to redo my floor here, and uh, I go to Thumbtack, I say... Uh, um, <laughs> I don't think you need to do, redo your floor. I don't need to, but if I wanted to, um, and I say I need to redo my floor, there I get a whole bunch of bids from a bunch of people. I'm really not qualified to evaluate them, but then I, I'm still going to pick someone, and then they're going to overbill me by 30% and deliver it three months late, and yep. I'm not going to be happy with the experience. Yep. Um, and so, instead, we 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 at FJ Labs, a company called Renoviso, where essentially you take a picture of your floor, you see your square footage, and they will pick the supplier for you. You just pay them; they manage the entire process. And so, doing these kind of managed marketplaces or supply yep. pick marketplaces where it looks to you, the consumer, as though the marketplace is the provider, even though it actually is a marketplace. Um, it leads to much higher net promoter score. And we're doing this in every category, like redoing your windows, redoing your boiler, uh, finding a plumber. Uh, but you can also do it for, you know, in the Upwork business, for finding developers or finding a customer care agent or whatever. Are you also looking in any other areas besides those kind of platforms, those kind of marketplaces? I mean, you mentioned having an interest in looking at some of the life science revolution that's coming down the road. Is that sort of where you're doing it deal by deal, but not really a theme for you yet? There are a number of developing themes we're considering. For, like, for instance, in food, right now we've only invent, reinvented or used technology to, to, to reinvent food ordering and to some extent food delivery. Uh, and even then, like, only the basics of it because it's like people delivering. Uh, but in food automation on the ordering side in restaurants, for instance, is something we're interested in. So we didn't invest in Itza, but it would be the type of thing we'd be interested in. We invested in a company called Zoom Pizza, where they use robots to cook the pizzas. And so you, you, you no longer have venues, you no longer have people, and whenever you order the pizza, uh, the truck uh, drives to you, cooks the pizza on the way, so they have higher quality ingredients, it comes out of the oven fresh, it gets to you closer, and despite being better and better ingredients and fresh out of the oven, it's 20 or 30% cheaper than, than Pizza Hut because it's made by the robots and not by people. You're, you're looking geographically at these opportunities, that, you know, just beyond Silicon Valley, obviously. You're yeah. based here in New York. Where would you look in particular, you know, or, or pretty much anywhere where there's a good opportunity? The, the problem is, as investors, we're driven by where can we deploy capital effectively, which means where are their exits. And so market sizes actually matters tremendously. And so we only look at large markets. Part of the issue with smaller markets, all, beyond the lack of exits, is also there's no Series A or Series B money available. So seed money is kind of available anywhere around the world. Late stage money, once you get there, is available anywhere around the world because the Tiger Globals or Insights yeah. will find you. But Series A and B money is actually really hard to come by in most countries. And so we only focus on the large ones. These days, 70% is US. Um, kind of everywhere in the U.S., but of course New York and Silicon Valley. 20% is uh, Europe, especially Germany, U.K., France, Spain, and Sweden, actually. 
uh, because they have a tendency to build global companies because the domestic market is small. And then 10% is Brazil, India, and a splattering of China. Uh, because their domestic markets are large enough that you actually have VCs, you actually have exits, um, and many of the f companies also have global ambitions, so you can actually make it work. Um, we don't invest in a, I don't know, Chile, for instance, because the domestic market is too small, unless you actually really have global or at least regional ambitions. And how do people approach FJ Labs for funding? So every week we get about 100 deals. Uh, we have a team of 15 people and we, the team looks at all the deals. Now, usually about 50 of them are really out of scope. So they're amazing, but they're like agriculture tech or hardware or, or, or something, we, or, or like biotech, where we don't really have any expertise. So we, we tell the entrepreneurs, you know, thank you, but no thank you. I mean, we, we, don't, we cannot help you because we don't know how to evaluate this. Yeah. Um, for the other 50, we typically interact. Uh, we do a one-hour call. Then the team on every Tuesday, we have a investment committee, committee meeting and for over two hours summarizes all of their interactions and their recommendation. And then Jose and I will take a call and it's a one hour call. So with, on the basis of two one hour meetings, we will make an investment decision. Yeah. And so usually in less than a week, you can, you can get a yes or no as to whether we're investing or not. Yeah. And we've been investing in one to two companies a week, basically, uh, for the last few years. And, yeah. th and that process works rather well. Yeah. Um, but it really works because there's a team that, to whom we've taught both our philosophy and thesis, but also our heuristics. So the way we decide whether to invest is three core heuristics yeah. that have nine, that have sub heuristics. So, do we like the team, which is an assessment of like intellect, ambition, passion, ability to execute, grit, tenacity? Do we like the deal terms and we're somewhat price sensitive? And number three, do we like the business? Now, do we like the business as nine underlying heuristics, like total addressable market size, uh, unit economics, capital efficiency, business model, scalability, little risk of disintermediation, I mean, a number of those. Yeah. And basically, we have kind of this checklist and we evaluate every company on that checklist. And if, if we like everything, we need to like everything. We need to like the team, the business, and, and the deal terms. And then we, we, we pull the trigger. And that's also on a deal that's already being led uh, uh, by another lead investor? So it may, the deal may be being led, and if it's not led, we will help them find a lead. So we're not leading, we're not pricing, we're not, we're not taking board seats. Uh, the way the deals come in, by the way, there's about a third come in directly because we're known as investors. Yep. A third come in because we share deal flow with other venture capitalists. Yep. Uh, by virtue of not, of not leading and not pricing and not having minimum equity requirements, we don't, we don't compete with them. Yep. Um, and in fact, many of them, we will bring great deals from C to A, B, C to later stage VCs, yep. and so they send us deals so we can co-invest with them and often we will find the companies leads and so we will bring them seed lead investors um, if we find something something and someone that we like and so because we're not really competing with VCs uh, we, we get a lot of deals from them and then yeah. the third aspect is every, to date we've backed 400 startups which means about a thousand entrepreneurs they come back for the next company they send sure. us their friends they send us their yeah. employees who decide to become entrepreneurs and so that's another great source of, of, of Deal potential fun. deals yeah yeah you also uh, find yourself as an investor you, you put in say that average say 400 check size do you follow as well into later rounds or is it really at, at that the one stage uh, that, that need you most that you that you put in? We follow on opportunistically. So maybe we follow on in 25% of the cases. Mm -hmm. um, we don't usually have enough capital to really do proper follow-ons. And because we own very little, on average we own like 2%, 3%, there's no negative signaling in us not following on, sure. and we're not taking board seats, et cetera, so it doesn't really matter. Usually we try to build a close relationship with the entrepreneurs. So the entrepreneurs, even though we're not on the board and we're active in 400, or we're investors in 400 companies, they often find this to be the most useful investors they have uh, because, first of all, we don't actually bother them. We don't ask for reporting. We don't ask for anything. If they want to give it, great. Uh, the reason we're helpful is when they want to fundraise in the next round, we, because we do full deal flow sharing with a number of VCs, we will actually help them work on their deck and we will introduce them to the VCs. And by virtue of making those introductions, they're going to get the meetings uh, and that saves them a huge amount of time because we're not conflicted. We're not going to be leading the round in any way, shape or form. Whereas the lead VC from the previous round may want to actually lead that round um, and so he's definitely not going to be introducing them to competing VCs. And so the entrepreneurs find that role of like helping them fundraise uh, probably the most value-added thing we do for them. That's great. Um, any last word of advice for entrepreneurs as to, you know, what it t 
takes? A few, a few general advice, I, I guess. One, it's actually these days very easy to build things for very, very little. So don't go to investors, ask for money to build, build a company. Uh, that actually proves you probably can't execute and bootstrap the business. So I'd rather you found like a couple hundred K in love money and fool's friends and family money executed, build something and launch, that shows you you know how to execute. And then for me, it's it's a little bit of risk and then I'm taking market risk, but I'm not taking execution risk. Um, second thing is everything should be tested. Like whatever your assumptions are, we, we live in a world where we can measure, which is the beauty of the internet. And so you should multivariate test everything you do. For, for disruptive product change is the sum total of 1% improvements done a thousand times over. And so if you keep doing statistically significant improvements or, or over every step of your funnel and every step of your product, you ultimately end up with something that's like massively better than what anyone else has. Um, and third, don't worry that much about competition. For the most part, things that destroy businesses or either the co-founder is fighting uh, or fighting with their board uh, or product market fit, business model, et cetera. Like it, it's rarely competition. And so be careful of your unit economics, control your burn. It's not like a land grab where you need to actually capture the entire country. Like you may actually be better off like making sure your business really truly works in a city, getting the scale there, getting to profitability, at least definitely unit economic profitability, then expand and, and then expand fast, but really create a sound solid base from which to expand on rather than a rush thinking that it's a land grab, which will probably set you up for failure. Yeah, that's what we, we call it. Nail it and then scale it. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, it's been just a wonderful uh, uh, overview for, for, of what FJ Labs does and what your own background is. Thanks so much for, Thank for having us. That's Thank great. You. 42 questions. That's why we're here in New York today. <laughs>